you can just tell me when I can kick off. Yeah, you can kick off now, Russ. That's perfect for us. No bother, no bother. Um, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you can all hear me okay. Um, as Ruth said, we're going to record a session like we have the last number. Um, today's session, I don't think it's going to take us uh, the full hour. I, I reckon somewhere around uh, 30 to 40 minutes. We're going to be discussing, as it says on the screen there, file format. Uh, but in particularly, I would say IFC, because if you attended the last number of sessions, we talk a lot about IFC and it's important for us, uh, it, its importance for us as quantity surveyors. Um, let's see if I can get this going. Yes, excellent. So not only are we going to discuss IFC, but the challenges that we have found in our experience with IFC, um, we're kind of hoping that it will help you in your discussions uh, when you're when you're chatting and speaking to design teams and when you're setting up the BIM execution plans and 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 all of that initial negotiation uh, in in the earlier stages of the projects. Um, as we've gone through the last number of BIM bites, we have been talking about the importance of these early engagements and early discussions with design teams um, and, and also the clients as well and getting them to understand the importance of this. So yeah, IFC and then some of the challenges we've come across with IFC over the last number of years. Um, I won't bother with introductions. You all know who I am at this stage, I guess. Uh, if not, find me on LinkedIn. Um, we're going to discuss these topics today. Uh, first of all, we'll introduce what is IFC and who developed it initially. Um, and then some of the challenges we've come across with IFC, as I mentioned, over the years, IFC files being too big for our uh, estimating or cost planning uh, uh, softwares to process. Uh, that's been a big challenge. Um, no quantities in when we export. Why don't we get quantities when we export? Too many names inclu included in family name, uh, duplicate elements, wrong modeling for quantities. We're particularly going to focus on quantities, obviously, because uh, you know that's uh, that's what we're really looking for. But information is key here as well, not just quantities. And then uh, quantities from uh, existing elements included as new. Um, big challenge, uh, especially on renovation projects, extension projects, all of that is how we deal with existing building components, building elements, uh, how are they um, named and configured within within the models, and more importantly, how are they exported uh, the units of measure project units within the um, within the IFC export elements and wrong families. Again, this is all where we're kind of discussing information allocation and making sure that um, it, it, that the design teams in particular and the discipline leads and, the, and their modelers are allocating the information as agreed within the BIM execution plan. Often you'll find that you have different modelers uh, for different disciplines, depending on the size of your project. So for sure, you will at least have one for architecture and one for, for, for engineering, but you might have one for structures you might have one for electrical you might have one for ventil for 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 plumbing you might have one for ventilation depending on how big your project is so understanding these parameters are key and then actually for from our perspective as qs is tracking them to make sure the quality is in them um model parameters again and then design team coordination as i just mentioned um some of you will argue that man, that's not our responsibility um we like to think that it is because we're part of the project team. And as quantity surveyors, we are processing the information produced by others. So in some respects, even if it's not clearly identified in the contract um, agreement with your client, it's something to discuss who is coordinating all of this. Uh, generally, the design teams and design lead, whoever that may, may be, will will coordinate the design team's output. But the reality is, is the design team does not process information. They produce it. Uh, we process the information. But let's just jump into uh, the first one here. Um, just a comment. If you guys have any questions or comments or anything through the course of this uh, discussion, uh, just write it in the chat box and we'll pick it up 
uh, at the end of, of the presentation. But um, I'm of the assumption that everybody knows what IFC is, um, but maybe we don't. So I, I've added this, I actually added this this morning um, because maybe we need to understand a little bit of what is IFC. And IFC, it's a standard uh, developed by Building Smart and it, IFC stands for Industry Foundation Classes. Uh, it's a common standard for data exchange in the construction industry that allows information sharing regardless of software of the software application being used. And now you can Google IFC and this is what you're going to get. You're going to get this um, explanation. Um, so in the olden days, like, or even today, like in Excel, a CSV export, uh, it's just a text, a text file. Um, and it helps for uh, communicating between different applications and softwares. We would always um, promote the use of IFC, as I mentioned. You can, of course, if, if any of you are working with Costex, you'll hear WF, WGFX, uh, like DWFX, sorry, WGFX. I would say not to use that because it's it's particular for Costex. I would say always use IFC. Um, you can import Navit Rivet files. Um, again, we would always try to use IFC. The reason for it is, is um, because it allows us to communicate with the design teams, but we're setting our, our, our project up for future stakeholders to work with IFC and work with this information in this format. Um, when the contractor comes on board, uh, when the supply chain come on board, et cetera, they will want uh, uh, IFC files depending on the software that, that they use. So it's it's always good for us to work as QSs in IFC. As I mentioned, uh, it was Building Smart International that developed uh, IFC formats, international organization responsible for development of IFC specification. Um, and I, I don't know what revision they're on at the moment, but they have been running for quite some years and new revisions of IFC come out uh, quite regularly. So it is good to to link up with, with Building Smart um, on LinkedIn, perhaps. And uh, we don't have an Irish uh, division of Building Smart, but there is in the UK, and obviously, Building Smart International. But um, they, they control the quality of the IFC formats and updates for any additional information and structures that come in. So uh, as I mentioned, keep a, a close eye on being smart. So the first element we're going to look at here when exporting uh, IFC and is files being too large. Um, a comment I should make is who has responsibility for the IFC export? We would always say that the design team have responsibility for the export because they have responsibility for their native file Let's just hypothetically say the architects are using Revit. They have responsibility for the Revit file. They have responsibility for the information that they produce. They have responsibility for the IFC export. If that is a challenge on your projects, I would say it's a client decision to tell the design team it's, it's their responsibility. Ideally speaking, in the BIM execution plan and the contracts, we get this in at the very, at the very early stages, just so that we're clear about who has responsibility. So... In the past and currently, we work very closely with the design teams when we are exporting the IFC files in the initial stages of the project, because the IFC file in totality is a monster file because it will export every single parameter from Revit, whether you want it or not, as a QS. So the file grows dramatically. Um, and a lot of that information is irrelevant to us uh, as process as processors of of certain information from from the three D models, um, I'll give you an example here. When we look at uh, the original Revit file size, this is just a previous project we looked at. It was thirty three megabytes. The IFC file was four hundred and fifty megabytes. Um, and why do you ask that? Why 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 does it increase so much from the native Revit files? Because IFC does its own calculation in terms of quantities as well, so it doubles up in information um, uh, in, in terms of quantum, but Something that we kind of noticed over the years was that um, uh, exporting duct uh, ventilation ducts with insulation from Revit, you can see here that uh, by not including the the duct pipe insulation, um, 
in the export, our IFC uh, file size dropped dramatically. Um, and it was a case of, was it relevant for us in our measurement process at that time? Um, we realized that because the files were so big, they were they weren't we weren't able to handle them within our platform, which is Costex we're using. So we decided to exclude them and then use the 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 duct lengths themselves to derive the insulation as uh, quantities. Um, and so a possible workaround here, as we say, like is a, is extra low settings at IFC export. And again, I would say that the design team should be able to help you with this. Uh, extra low settings will still give you the information you need, but it'll remove a lot of the 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 irrelevant information, and it'll make the size of the file much more manageable uh, within your platforms. And I, I would guess a lot of you guys working with uh, with BIM, uh, 3D and 5D, and 4D, I guess as well, you often will import native Re native Revit files. It also works for sure, but. As I mentioned at the beginning, IFC is the kind of common language, so it it, it makes more sense to 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 communicate in IFC, especially if design teams use other types of of software, a design software like Tecla and Archicad, et cetera, et cetera. So IFC becomes a common language. Um, no quantities in the export. Uh, that can be a challenge and an issue from time to time. You will notice that very quickly when you begin to try and map in, 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 in your uh, estimating software or your model viewer using Celebri or, or whatever platform you use. Uh, base quantity values are calculated from the model geometry as part of the IFC export process. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, when you export an IFC, IFC does it own, its own calculation on base quantities. That's why the files get so big. Uh, it does it, its own check. Um, and then uh, the IFC export process and are not explicit properties of the host model. So the model uh, dimensional properties should be included in the IFC as, as a property set uh, in preference of or in addition to base quantities. Reason being is that quantities calculated by the IFC model might be incorrect. You need to also uh, export the um, native property sets from Revit or whatever platform. Again, it's it's when exporting this, it's a lot of box ticking and checking um, with the BIM coordinator on the design disciplines side, whether it's the architect or the engineer in order for us. And, and a lot of it's trial and error as well. Um, when working with this information, um, the better the BIM execution plan, the better the the quality of quality control on the information within the models. The I would say the quicker you'll be able to agree an export um, in in IFC. Um, and I must say I'm not the expert in this either. We have uh, team members internally that are absolutely the experts. Um, I just like presenting about it, I guess. Uh, type name uh, includes uh, family name. So for the IFC generation, unselect. This is just a tip uh, from, from our perspective. Again, trial and error over the years and when exporting uh, is just to untick this uh, uh, um, use of, of, of families as references. Um, it helps later in terms of that, uh, that you can see it on the right-hand side. The information is the same except for that use of uh, family references. So that basic, that base wand, for example, it's removed on the left hand side, and all you want is that STB, that that naming reference when exporting, um, so that you can use it and link it to your your cost plans, and bills of quantities, etc. Uh, so you're not retyping. So uh, again, more quality assurance on the information uh, uh, over anything, I would say. And, and trial and error, as, as I mentioned before, uh, and it, it takes a lot of communication with the design teams to try and get this right uh, on, on every single project. It's not about doing it once either, I must mention. The, the fact is, is that every single project that you work on will have different design teams, different capabilities, uh, different experience when it comes down to the BIM coordinators and potentially the design team have never worked with a, a QS uh, before. Um, and it's the first time they're being asked for this type of information. Um, or for the IFC to be uh, structured in this way. So it does take a little bit of uh, 
um, of collaboration between the, the different stakeholders. Duplicate elements, uh, wrong modeling. Um, this is always a challenge, excuse me, um, as modelers are, 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 are developing their, their 3D models. Uh, they're off, often using historical information or historical elements within the model to create new ones. Often you'll find that you'll have double up on elements and um, giving you wrong quantities at the end of the day, like double slabs where you can't really see the double slab until you dig into the model. Um, of course, that affects your overall quantity. And this is a quality, quality assurance process that we're now doing as, as QS is on the, on the modeled information, because obviously we want to verify the quantities that we're using. So uh, it's often uh, important to do high level checks, I would say, on elements just to make sure that you're pulling in the right uh, approximate quantity. So for example, uh, calculating your overall uh, floor slabs to make sure that are you there or thereabouts in the floor slabs that you're pulling through with, from your IFC into your estimating platform. Same with the, the large area elements like ceilings and walls, et cetera. Just doing high level checks will always um, offer up that additional quality assurance. Um, be, uh, be careful for, for double modeling. And we'll get into more of this in in, uh, in a second uh, when it comes to uh, is it existing elements and so on. But uh, just on on the note that's there, so if more than one floor element is created within one floor boundary, it will be divided into a number of separate elements, and that can be that can be a challenge um, depending on how the modeler has modeled it. So just to, again by just checking this, whether it's in your estimating software or, or Celebri or Revit Viewer, um, it will add some quality assurance to you for sure. Um, existing elements included as new. So especially on the renovation projects and the extension projects, um, often you'll find is that uh, design teams will model existing elements um, just to, to highlight them within the, within the model. Now that that could be a case that they scan the existing building. It could also be a case that they they import uh, an old model uh, or they have an import an old old drawings and develop a model. But nevertheless, uh, it's it's important that when the design teams are, are designing this, that that they identify that those elements are existing. And often the design teams won't understand um, the reasoning behind identifying them so clearly. Of course, from our perspective, as QSs, we'll need to know, you know, what's what is new, what is existing, what is part of the demolition, what isn't, um, so that we are able to identify that in our bills of quantities and cost plans and be able to quantify it. Obviously, um, that can be quite uh, quite challenging, especially in the early stages of the design uh, design processes, uh, when uh, the quality isn't really there yet in the models. They're really just producing the models for drawings. Um, but if we keep up and keep on with the with the bin coordinators and the modelers, we should be able to get that quality out of the out of the models in the early stages so that we can we can begin to process that information. And as you communicate this with the design teams, they begin to understand why a little bit more effort in those early stages uh, can offer a lot of value on the on on the output on the back end of the gateway of the stage. Um, so again, we mentioned uh, a number of um, a number of bytes back about uh, continual communication with the design team could be weekly with the different discipline leads that becomes important to pick up items like this <clears throat> and running your own weekly test on the models it might not be weekly it might be fortnightly it might not be fortnightly it might be every three weeks it depends on the project but understanding that yourself along with the design teams allows you then to check for this stuff um incrementally as opposed to a huge bulk check at the back end of a delivery. Because if you're going back to the design team at that late stage with all of these challenges and issues that you're identifying the model, they'll be pissed. So we need to be able to do this incrementally over time with them. And by doing that, you're adding quality in, in, in small pieces rather than these huge chunks at the back end of, of a design uh, phase where everybody's under pressure and you know stress and everything within the project. Sorry, no. Uh, so existing uh, versus new, uh, very important to identify that within the models. And you'll get that when your IFC exports as well. So that you can identify them. Um, so that, um, sorry, yeah, just coming into the office. Um, project units are another thing. Um, you can see here within, 
within this particular project, uh, it's a uh, feet and inches uh, project from the US. But often you find with the different uh, design teams uh, uh, working on the project that they might have incorrectly or accidentally uh, identified the unit of measure uh, incorrect. And of course, that has a huge effect on your quantum output and uh, and and how you measure. But I'm sure that we will pick that up pretty quickly when we're pulling out quantities of, of this type of, of, of numbers. Um, but just identify that it should be part of the BIM execution plan. We can all agree that it should be part of the design team's qualification of the information. We can all agree that. But often people make errors and, and hopefully we can pick that up when we begin to identify. But these easy checks, once you import your IFC, are, are quite good. And um, I think that uh, uh, we have, we've we learned a lot of lessons about this uh, in the past, for sure. Um, elements of the wrong families. Uh, again, once you import your IFC, it's a, it's, it's a challenge. Um, um, so objects that had that that do not have corresponding placeholders in IFC um, a schema need to be manually measured or manually mapped to an, uh, an alternate IFC element prior to export. Um, and just reading the text, if this is not done, uh, they will be exported as a general solid object. And those solid objects become challenging for us because um, it's uh, it's difficult for for us to be able to identify identify that. Uh, just two seconds there. Um, so making sure that the that uh, we the elements that are identified by the design team are are in the with the correct families etc. You can do this by running by running uh, information outputs. Again, Salibri is always good. Um, it's it's a quick uh, a quick checker on the quality of information in the three D models. Um, and uh, uh, it's also a quick check on the quality of IFC export before you begin to import it into uh your estimating software and um, it can process the information uh much quicker if you like um and i would say that elements in in wrong families is 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 very common it's a very common challenge that we have uh especially when the design teams are are developing their design and there's there's time issues and people are trying to get stuff developed so again you have to remember that from a design team's perspective, what they're trying to do is to get drawing output. They're just trying to get their drawings prepared for the delivery. Um, so the quality of the information in the model might not be there, but from a geometric perspective, the, the window is identified, the door is identified. Uh, once you cut your drawings, they're there. Uh, but from an information perspective, in terms of how we work with information, that quality isn't there. So that's that's where we step in um, and and it's what we've been talking about over the last number of of BIM bytes is where we need to come in and communicate and help the design teams to to get this information to a good quality level at the initial stages, doing it once rather than coming back at the end of stages and trying to build on that quality. If we can get them into a working process of quality information production consistently, it means that they're not having to go back and retrospectively look for errors in the information and, and update. So the IFC uh, in, in this instance uh, um, will help you once you import into your system to, 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 to check that, I would say. A um, couple of more elements here, uh, model parameters ensure that the quantity of parameters exported to the, to the IFC. Uh, I would say that um, when checking, and you can see the check boxes down here, when checking all this information, initially IFC exports will run everything, but as we mentioned before, it might not be necessary. So we need to be able to run through this uh, with the design teams to say what is important to us and, and what is not. Um, customizing the IFC export settings to include only the essential parameters, as we mentioned before, will reduce that file size and it'll make the, the the workability of the file much more uh yeah, easy and 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 workable for us within our software and um, working with 450 megabytes is impossible and um, it, it really slows up uh, everything that we do uh, within our platforms i would say um and there's a small example here uh an architectural model with over 700 parameters customization helps make the IFC file 
less overwhelming and more user friendly. So Revit itself has an awful lot of embedded parameters that are automatic within Revit and that will be exported in IFC uh, automatically if you do not uncheck uh, those elements. And as we mentioned before, it's good to work with the design teams. I would say that over the years, we have developed an understanding of what needs to be looked at and what doesn't. It's trial and error. There's no real formula to this. There's nowhere you can go uh, that has uh, exact features for this because it really is a quantity surveyor's requirement. Um, from a contractor's requirement or design requirement, generally what would happen is that they'd work within within Revit and IFC would be a, a kind of a, a secondary export uh, if they're doing 4D. But from our perspective, it's really important for us to be able to understand this uh, so that we can we can have those discussions with the design teams. And as I mentioned, it becomes a trial and error uh, challenge. Uh, and from project to project, we, your teams will get better and better in terms of their understanding of, of what to look for and what to look at when exporting. And everything is about, I guess, coordination uh, and and communication. So design team coordination, you know, that's not really our responsibility, but at the end of the day, it's important that we understand how design teams work together or we understand how um, design teams work with each other. So it becomes important for us to really look out for these uh, trip hazards, if you like, with design teams working uh, in in multi disciplines or multi multi companies, uh, especially on the major projects. Um, so the first note there, like when multiple companies work on separate discipline models for a project, it is crucial to establish coordination to maintain uniform model parameters. What does that mean, Ross? Um, if you have an architectural firm working on the architectural models, and you have a engineering firm working on the engineering models. And within the engineering firm, you have uh, a department, which is a structural engineering working on the structural model. And you have the MEP department working on the services models. They're all different modelers. They're different disciplines. They're different teams. And often what you find is when the information comes back, the quality levels are different within the information purely because the teams themselves aren't really coordinating properly. And, and you can argue, well, that's not our responsibility. Uh, we're just a quantity surveyors. And again, I'll, I'll come back to my kind of open comment is that we're the, we're the users of this information. If we want our process to be streamlined and high quality, we need to be, we need to be able to trust the information we're getting from the design teams, meaning that we should be looking at this stuff. We should be looking at it as we receive the information to make sure that they are coordinating and then reflecting back to whoever has, if it's the client, if, if, the, if the client has uh, an overall kind of uh, uh, BIM consultant, we should be feeding that information back to them. But part of our process is the quality assurance of this. So um, especially on the larger projects, uh, this is this is always a challenge. And even if it is one design company doing electrical, uh, sorry, doing architecture and, and engineering, it is still different teams internally. It's it's still different disciplines. It's still different modelers. And um, so even if it is one company, I, I would absolutely uh, look out for this on every single project that you work on. Um, and consistency, consistency on the parameters, um, making sure that the naming conventions are as agreed in the BIM execution plan. Now, we, we can't identify all naming requirements. We can follow... Uh, ISO uh, 19650 as presented last week by Mary um, we can define matrix on projects as appendices to the BIM execution plan but we can't define everything and a small example here is on a recent project we worked on different discipline models within the same project they had different naming conventions for the lint parameter so lint base quantity lint lint one dimension lengths. now that's a challenge for us especially if we're mapping and using this information when we map um, within our, our uh, estimating software. Because as the modelers uh, qualify this, and they'll pick this up themselves from time to time, I would say, but we should be raising the concern for sure. 
um, if they begin to change this information during the course of the design process, which they will, it's it's inevitable. Uh, it affects what we have all ma or previously mapped historically, and it means that what we've mapped historically is no longer mapped, and we need to remap. So, what I'm trying to say here is that quality assurance as early as possible will have the best outcome for us as QSs. It will streamline our process, um, and the IFC export is for sure the number one language uh, to understand um, from a design perspective in their export, but also how we import it to our platforms and how our platforms uh, communicate with this IFC language. Um, but I guess that's all I have for you guys today. As I mentioned, it would be a short one focusing on IFC and the quality of information coming from IFC. Um, hopefully some of these tips will help you guys when you begin to work with this. And I'm sure some of you already are and you've come across this stuff before. Um, it is a, it, it can be challenging for us for sure. Uh, but I'll go back to what we see on every single uh, BIM bite. Uh, collaboration with the design team is key here now. BIM is forcing us to, to collaborate more and to be, I guess, part of a singular unit delivering the project. Um, and the IFC export is no different. Uh, we need to be able to communicate our needs and what we want with the design team so that we get what we want to make our workflow as fluid as possible. So we're not burning hours and wasting time and energy on redoing work, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's really what this is about. It's about getting the best out of the information produced by the other stakeholder groups to make our processes smooth and, and as, as quick as possible and as efficient, I guess. Yeah, but that's it for me today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, raise your hand or uh, I'll try and answer them. As I said before, I'm not the expert in IFC. Um, we have we have experts in house that deal with this, but um, I'll do my best to answer. And if not, I'll come back to you later. Thanks, Ross. We uh, Sean just has his hand up there. Sean, do hey, you Sean. want to unmute yourself? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's probable that I won't get the terminology entirely right, so apologies for that. No give problem, a, give a, a eager learner here at the very early stages, but it, um, it it strikes me that the key the key information that we would need, and I presume that we would need to be feeding into the BIM execution plan or whatever, is the ultimate ability to be able to prepare our bills of quantities from the geometry or whatever contained within the model. Yep. Um, is, there a, is there a roadmap out there where the producers of the various standard methods of measurement produce some form of data requirement register that you could give to, you know, a BIM modeler who, you know, so we've got the ARM4 or the SMM7 or NRM2 in one yeah. hand, and then we've got this super duper model in the other hand. Yeah. And it strikes me that, you know, for me, for example, being at the early stages of this, surely there must be a pathway where, you know, we need to measure steel and weight ranges. So, guys, yeah. when you're modeling the steel, model it in these ranges. That's only one example. But is there that document in the industry? If there's not, is it common? It strikes me as fairly obvious. A quick, I, I, and if anybody else on the call has their has an opinion on this, please absolutely jump in. But this is very controversial, of course, now, Sean. So I'm just going to Hello. give my opinion on it, and uh, let's see if I have any friends left in the industry. But right now, I would say that our method of method of measurement does not coordinate with our methods of modeling. Our methods of modeling are different to our methods of measurement. Now, if we're going to get the most out of the information available to us in the digital 3D, we need to alter our methods of measurement so that it suits more the methods of modeling than it does the traditional older methods of measurement, if that makes sense. So you're asking for a mapping service here. So kind of your comment on weights of steel is a good one. So we we want the design, we want the structural engineer and the, and the modeler to, to, to model the same way we measure. That will never happen. That it will never it will never happen because our information is a is a is an output after the fact. So 
our our way of measuring is after a design is is prepared, not before a design is prepared. So my opinion is that we need to alter our, our methods of measurement to suit how we model so that we can get uh, more information from the model. So I guess to answer your question, Sean, is no, nothing like that is available at the moment. Not that I have seen, but again, if anybody on the call has come across anything like that um, from anywhere in the world, uh, it would be great to, if you could just jump in there with your with your opinion. The public works and the public works projects are going to be more challenging, I would say. Uh, NRM2 is a little bit better. If someone has their hand up there, GMG. Hi, Ross. How are you? Uh, sorry, it's uh, Graeme McGrath here. Hey, Graeme. Um, just you mentioned uh, public works there. And also uh, in your presentation, you were looking at different kind, let's say, prefabricated items like windows and doors and things like that. Yeah. Um, just from a public point of view, how is that going to work um, when... Because I, I know these manufacturers like Velux and so on, they're creating their own BIM models for yeah. uh, to, be, to be pulled directly into the model. How right. is that going to work from, let's say, a public works point of view? Is it going to be that we're pulling in, let's say, the Velux window or whatever window it is and plastered underneath it, underneath everything is going to be uh, equal to yeah. or equivalent? Like, you know, I would say that... Uh... Yeah, because obviously under the public works, you can't specify any suppliers and uh, it needs to be generic, but you you can pull in the, and a lot of the design teams, a lot of the architects will have these these particular um, components in within their library bases and they'll use them, but they won't specify the, the actual supplier and type. Um, so I would say that currently they can do that no problem. The geometries will 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 fit more to a, a Velux than it would to Velux's competitors. But nevertheless, you will have an equal or approved because of the uh, of the uh, the way that we procure our public works. Um, I would say that in in terms of the method of measurement, we Arm Five is to come out uh, early next year, and and yeah, it it will be great to see if. ARM5 actually has really considered uh, how projects are designed today in 3D to allow us to be able to quantify uh, much more quicker, I would say, and not quicker, automated, uh, than it than ARM4 would allow us to do. Uh, ARM4, you, you have to do an awful lot of work with the information to date to be able to, to derive quantities and take them directly from the models. Uh, as it is at the moment, which is one of the reasons why we're not transitioning quick enough as a as a as a discipline, uh, from my perspective. But uh, we haven't got any eyes on on what the new ARM five is yet. Um, yeah. But in terms of public works, I don't think there's a challenge there in terms of the public works in in bringing in in bringing in uh, components from from libraries and and not identifying supplier names underneath them, um, and and leaving it up to the contractor to decide uh, if they can meet the spec. But uh, in terms of yeah. how we quantify, it, I'm that's absolute challenge going back to sean's point yeah and then just sorry another question i had was um because i come from an architectural background myself so um when you're looking at let's say a drawing and there's certain elements in drawings that just don't get drawn um particularly in 2d yeah. for example uh wall ties would probably be a good example an important element but important item but they, they never get drawn they're just they're written yeah. How will they? How will items like that? Yeah. Be pulled into the bill or or into the model and from the model into your bill. You know. Yeah, it comes back to the level of granularity that you you need within your BOQ, and and if you go to ARM four, the level of granularity is a little serious in ARM four. You know, we all, I always use the example of in, uh, intersections in in stud partitions, three ways abutments, two way intersections, corners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I, I I asked a question, where's the real value in spending time quantifying that when you look at the overall capex of a project? Is there any value in that really? And can we change our method of measurements to include within the square meter price for those and allow the supply chain to take on the, the risk of, of those elements within the square meter price we get back? Um, and I think this is where the, it really becomes a challenge for us because in the industry, we're, we're, we have now been working with uh, arm for quite some time and we're very used the entire industry is used to that granularity from 
from the design teams to the quantity surveyors right down to the to the supply chain but really the amount of time it takes us to to produce cost plans and 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 builds the quantities in that granularity where are we spending our time wisely is probably the the question i'm asking um should we really be focusing on that for your wall ties element i don't see that as a challenge because uh within, that, within that was just within, purely an example sorry but yeah, there are other other items. like here's another one is painting less than 150 or 300 i can't remember what it is is there is there is there real value in that like us sitting down quantifying that is there real value in that or should we be just transferring on that that kind of a, a quote unquote risk to the to the painter and saying look here's the square meters of your entire wall the 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 other elements of that perhaps are yours to to relate to or another option is we have a tiered element of granularity so that if you're on the client side you're working at a certain level in terms of of cost granularity when you go down along the supply chain it develops more and more like when the contractor is pricing a bill of quantities they're looking at labor labor plant materials etc or 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 subcontractors um and allow them to work in that granularity but is that really necessary for for us on the client side as consultants uh, to work in that granularity. These are questions that we have right now within the industry, I would say. Um, so I don't yeah. really know which way it's going to go, to be honest. Um, Just yeah. um, I'm, like, I suppose from a public sector point of view as well, um, it's, uh, it's never been more important to have absolutely everything within the bill. We, we are so claims conscious yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. And um like you're 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 genuinely concerned that you're gonna miss something. Yeah. And this is this adds, let's say, another layer of risk. Yeah. It's an awful lot of um responsibility on let's say the the designer now. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the way I see it. We, our public works, we have a challenge in, in, in all of that over the last Kind of decade or more after the the Celtic Tiger, I think our contracts have driven us to a to this kind of granular level of of risk aversion, and it's uh, it's adding more and more stress and pressure to projects. So, rather than us being more collaborative as an industry, we've gone in the opposite direction over the last ten years. And the challenge that we're now having is with 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 BIM and and with digital design and construction. We're coming. We're, we need to change our direction 180 degrees in order for us to be able to develop and deliver projects together. So, the new regulations coming out next year. One thing from from the Office of Public Procurement or Government Procurement. The other thing is how how are they going to be reflected in the new contracts that come out? Also, um, the G Triple C will that be changed? I, again, I'm not the expert in this area. I, I don't I don't know, but uh, I think government have an awful lot to do to soften up the industry a little bit from the the regulations that are currently in place under the contract as you mentioned um it's yeah. it, it's not a very nice working collaborative environment when when you're working under that kind of strain and, and granularity uh for sure yeah all right thanks Russ. no bother and um, there was just yes. a comment there from Jonathan as well about the main contractors breaking up the BOQ to a subby who'll need the smaller granular info to price it as well. So I think Jonathan was just adding adding to the conversation there, Russ. Yeah, I think we really have to reconsider what we're doing now today. Like the the, the I kind of, I guess the how we've been producing and working as QSs over the last twenty years is is changing, and one of the reasons we're not transitioning quick enough into the new digital way of working is that we're trying to fit those old processes into what is now a, a completely different way of working. Um, and so, so maybe we need to consider the fact that we need to change dramatically in order to be able to fit into the new way of working in terms of digital design and, and information. Um, I don't think we can, we can bolt on ARM4 onto a, a new way of working and say, we're done, this is how it needs to be now. I also don't think that we can ever ask the design teams to develop designs further than they already are. In the future, we will be because we'll be able to have uh, uh, automated designs and so on as you know, uh, artificial intelligence develops, et cetera. But at the moment, we, could, we can never ask the design teams to alter their process so much because they initially, they come before us. They are the creators of information that, that then we use in our process. So we need to alter, I would say, uh, an awful lot in order 
for us to get the most out of the industry. Otherwise, I don't think we'll ever transition. We'll always have this challenge and, and we'll always be poking heads, I would say, with the information we're getting versus the information we need. Um, so maybe we have a, a, a challenge ahead of us, but it's not just ours here. It's the same in the UK. It's the same with any quantity surveying uh, uh, discipline in, in, in any country that, that has these uh, standards in place for such a long time. Um, it really is going to be interesting over the next few years how we uh, how we alter that. I'd like to hear your opinion, by the way, out there. If anybody has opinions on on this, has anybody ever thought about the the, the fact that the ARM four and ARM five are could be outdated? Uh, do we need more detail? Do we need less detail? What's what's your opinion? Should we do away with bills of quantities? Do we need bills of quantities? All of this has an impact, and it's really kind of connected with you know, the, the, the automation of quantification and, and, and potentially a lot of the automation of quantity surveying services. No one's jumping into that one. No one's going to put the head in the block. <laughs> um, and of course, we're, we're often we talk about big projects at the moment, it'll be big projects like the rollout of the stand of the requirements next year, over a hundred million, then over 50 million, et cetera. But, as we begin to pick off the low hanging fruits of this and begin to understand ourselves with the, 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 the stakeholder groups we work with, the process that's involved, we'll end up getting down to the smaller projects. It will be the, 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 the housing estates of 15 and 20 houses. They'll be done in the same way, not next year, not the year after, but in 10 years time, we're going to get to this because it'll just be standard working practice for us. But I would argue that we have to look at our own standards uh, uh, in order to make sure that they're evolving along with how the industry is evolving, not just in Ireland, but globally, because in, in effect, it's the global industry that's driving the technology development. It's the global industry that's driving the standards within with digital design and, and BDC. Um, it's, not the, it's not the Irish standards driving that, it's global standards. So we would need to alter our standards to make sure that we're globally com compliant now with the with the evolution that's going on. So so let's see, and next year will be an exciting one, I think. Yes. Thank you very much for those questions. That's we have one more question there that's um about any advanced pointers on what's coming out in M5. Is it going to be more efficient measurement wise, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I'll be honest. We haven't got eyes on it yet. Um, there's only one person on the call that has the 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 knowledge there. If Mary, if you're still there, uh, I think you're part of the team there, sitting on that board. Maybe you're 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 not on the call anymore. But uh, we, uh, as part of the BIM group uh, with the SCSI, we haven't got uh, um, a pre read of that yet. So actually, I, I don't know. Um, rumor has it that it's going to have coding on it, but. As I mentioned, and this again, it's, this is only my opinion and it's confrontational, uh, I would say, is that coding is not enough. We have to make sure that our new methods of measurement look at our modeling methods so that we can get as much automation as possible from our models or being able to at least being able to use the information available to us because ARM4 is not fit for purpose. And so ARM5 absolutely has to be or we'll, we'll be having an ARM6 by the end of next year. Again, that's my that's only my opinion, so uh, don't hold me to that. And you can cut this part out of the recording, Ruth, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Like if we, if we look at other countries, there's many countries in the world they don't have methods of measurement, so the process of of quantification is much simpler. They're just following a modeling process and extracting quantities, and they're the quantities that are available to you. And our challenge is obviously, as I mentioned, we have we we've, we've many many years of this of methods of measurement and, and pricing rules that are embedded and ingrained in our daily working process as quantity surveyors. But most of the world doesn't have methods of measurement. And they are the, the, the countries that are absolutely driving on on VDC, digital design and construction, and driving on an automation. Um, so we really need to look at that, I would say. Just add one more comment, please. No, nope. sorry, I've been no problem, Sean. Yeah, um, no, no, I'm just I'm reflecting now on whether in 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 listening to the bin bites so far, I was building a picture in my mind where in these early stage discussions of the execution plan, I would be trying to relay the methods of measurement 
to the modeler and trying to get as much out of that. So are we actually saying it, it's at a slightly more basic level where the QS feeds into that kind of BIM execution plan where we're saying to the guys, look, only model one slab if things are length measured it on its center line. Is that the type of input from a QS at that early stage that we're talking about here? You you, you could you could never enforce the methods of measurement on the, the modeling and design process. The design team would never take it on because the level of additional time it would take to develop that just for just for an output that currently suits one discipline. It 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 would it would never work. Um, so what we need to be able to Again, I'll reflect, and this is just, again, my opinion, is that our method of measurements are too detailed and we need to be able to maybe step back a bit before we can step forward to understand really how we model to, to, to be able to take, uh, and again, any, I think the steel one is quite a good one, the ranges of steel. The design team don't design in ranges of steel, they design in components, so beams, columns, uh, uh, what have you. They don't, they'll never define for you the ranges of, of, of steel. They'll tell you that steel type or the beam type or the column type. It's for us then to try and derive that information. So we, we will never get our method of measurement into the modeling process, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion, uh, because it's, it's, it would mean that the modelers and the design team would still need to understand our discipline extremely well. And a lot of us don't even understand our method of measurement that well. So how can we expect the design team to understand the methods of measurement on a project? That was along the lines of the initial question. Thinking, well, you might be able to catch, you know, 75% of the requirement in some nice articulate output that's yeah. not done by a QS or a modeler, but it could be kind of jointly compiled that kind of yeah. is, is the kind of rule book for a model that will ultimately be used to measure a build arm four, because that's what yeah. we've got at the minute. But no, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Yeah. No bother. Um, it is. I think NRM two is a better is a better method of measurement uh, than uh, than ARM four. ARM four is too is too granular, is too detailed. Uh, NRM two is a is a nicer uh, method of measurement, to be honest, and that's what generally we would use on our international projects. Is is NRM two um, at least as a base point for for measurement. Um, so. Let's see. ARM five might take that on board. Uh, again, I, uh, we haven't, we have, we don't have eyes on it, so we can't comment uh, on it. But as soon as we have, we'll uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some messaging out to the SCSI and and so on about uh, about it. But yeah. we had uh, another comment from Raymond there in the chat. Raymond, do you want to unmute yourself and bring up your point, or I can read it out if you prefer. Oh, it was just a, a point really about the, the transition from, <clears throat> pardon me, from SMM7 to NRM. Mm. I can remember at the time it being described as, you know, the categories changing from the depth of the spade mm. uh, with a man digging to the depth of the machine bucket, which is why some of the categories opened up. So, yeah, I, I think methods of measurements will always evolve, but at the same time, just by their nature, they're always going to be I'll not say lagging, but you know, there's there's going to be a little bit of a of a a time gap between current mod models of operation and when a method of measurement is updated. Uh, it it was yeah. more just a, a general comment than a specific question. You're probably right. Is 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 it is it is it the case that we're trying to update the previous version to a new version? What if we binned the previous version and we started from scratch and we said, actually, how do we model? How do we design? How do we best get the, the value out of our projects here uh, uh, from a cost control quantum automation perspective? That's just a, a, a general question. Uh, you know, If we try to update something that's not fit for purpose anyway, are we starting on a rocky foundation? Should we scrap it? Again, controversial. Um, very controversial <laughs> but that's what these these uh bin bites are for we have to be controversial within our discipline otherwise nothing will ever change and we'll be here in a year and two years time and five years time having the same conversation and nothing will happen um so i think it's it, it's important for us to be confrontational and, and kind of get down to the like dirty laundry of it all and and you know and and have these uh, debates uh, only from these debates will we be able to get a consensus from all of us in what direction we should go as a as a discipline 
super. Uh, I think that our uh, short version turned into a full version today. Thanks very much for the Absolutely. engagement. And, uh, and it's I find these kind of conversations brilliant because uh, disrupting is is what we should be doing here to drive on our industry. And uh, and it's great to talk about the methods of measurement because I don't think we're talking about them enough as a as a, a, a professional discipline because they're going to affect us so much. Uh, once the new me the measurement uh, method of measurement arm five comes out, uh, it's directly linked to all our public works, and um, maybe we're not happy with the way it's going to be produced. But then again, let's see. Uh, we could be surprised. Great, thanks as always, Ross, for for today's session and for everyone's discussion. We'll see you back on Friday for lecture five. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.